The gait pattern of a centipede is pretty phenomenal. All these individual body segments joined together, working as a functional unit, completely unlike what is seen in humans, right? Well, not so fast. Although it's not nearly as awe-inspiring, there is a similar sort of segmentation seen through the human thorax, as each space between individual ribs has its own group of muscles, its own vascular supply, and its own innervation, which is best demonstrated through dermatome maps of the thorax. We're going to examine each of these aspects in turn, in our discussion of the muscles and neurovascular supply of the anterolateral thoracic wall. Welcome back. In the previous segment, we discussed the framework of the thoracic cage, consisting of the thoracic vertebrae, ribs, costal cartilages, and sternum. Now it's time to add the musculature and look at the mechanics of muscular contraction and movements of the costal vertebral joints which generate movement. Specifically, we're going to look at the three layers of intercostal muscle and describe how contraction of these muscles assists in the generation of movement. We'll also look more closely at the neurovascular components that were touched upon in the previous session. We've already encountered a few muscles that attach in some fashion upon the thoracic cage. The other attachments for these extrinsic muscles were on the vertebral column or upper limb, where they exert their effects. In contrast, the intercostal muscles we are about to describe are intrinsic, with their origin and insertion between different rib segments. Their principal blood supply are the intercostal vessels, and all are segmentally innervated by the intercostal nerves. The external intercostal muscle is the outermost layer. The muscle is prominent posterolaterally, but towards the sternum, the fibers start to taper. Closest to the sternum, the fibers disappear altogether, leaving only the translucent epimecium facial covering behind, known as the external intercostal membrane. You can think of it like a piece of roast beef wrapped in saran wrap, where the beef doesn't extend out the entire way, leaving a double layer of translucent plastic wrap behind, with no meat in between. Where the fibers are present, they run in an oblique pattern, inserting more distally on the inferior rib than the superior. I typically refer to this as the hands-in-pocket orientation, as your fingers are oriented in a similar sort of direction when you go to stick your hands in your pocket. Just deep to the external intercostals are the internal intercostals. Again, the fibers run between adjacent ribs, but in a roughly perpendicular fashion to the external intercostal muscles, attaching more proximally to the inferior rib. I'll typically refer to this as the surgeon washing hands orientation as this is the direction the fingers run in when a surgeon holds his hands up, letting the water run down to his or her elbows. Another difference between external and internal intercostals is that the fibers are prominent anteriorly and can actually be seen just deep to the external intercostal membrane. I've left the external intercostal muscles in place and made them particularly translucent in this image to give you some perspective on how this would look. In contrast to the external intercostals, these fibers taper out as they run posteriorly, leaving an internal intercostal membrane projecting towards the vertebral column. Finally, we have the innermost intercostal muscles, which can be seen on the internal surface of the rotating image. As the name implies, they lie on the innermost surface of the costal space, separated from the internal intercostals by the neurovascular structures we'll be describing next. The fiber orientation is similar to that for the internal intercostal muscles, and the fibers taper both anteriorly and posteriorly. Two other small groups of muscles to be aware of. The subcostal muscle group are a small set of vertically running fibers found near the angles of the ribs. The transversus thoracis muscles are more prominent and found anteriorly, running from the internal surface of the sternum to the coastal cartilages. This now brings us to a discussion of the neurovascular bundles embedded between the ribs, the intercostals. There are 11 pairs of arteries, veins, and nerves that course through the intercostal spaces along the subcostal grooves of the ribs. Notice that they run between the internal and innermost intercostal muscle layers. The vein is the most superior of the triad, followed by the artery and nerve. We often use the mnemonic VAN to describe this orientation. 
Looking specifically at the arterial supply, each pair of arteries branch from the posterolateral aspect of the aorta, wrapping bilaterally around thoracic vertebral bodies to reach the intercostal spaces. As the aorta is directed to the left of the midline, the right intercostal arteries are longer in length in comparison to the left. The highest branch to come off the aorta supplies the third intercostal space. An indirect branch from the third intercostal artery projects superiorly, anastomosing with a branch off the costal cervical trunk to supply the first and second intercostal spaces. This branch off the costal cervical trunk is referred to as the superior or supreme intercostal artery. As the intercostal arteries course along the thoracic wall, they provide dorsal perforating branches to supply the intrinsic back musculature and lateral perforating branches to supply the skin. From the front, anterior intercostal arteries branch from the internal thoracic arteries and course laterally to anastomose with the branches off the aorta. In appearance, however, the intercostal arteries appear as one long continuous connection between the aorta and the internal thoracic arteries. The anterior and posterior intercostal veins follow similar courses to the artery. In the front, the anterior veins drain into the internal thoracic veins running with the respective arteries. Posteriorly, however, the drainage is a little different. As the veins collect together, they drain into what is known as the azagous system. On the right, the veins drain into the vertically oriented azagous vein. On the left side, the 9th through 11th intercostal veins tend to drain into a hemiazygous vein, whereas the upper intercostal veins will drain into an accessory hemiazygous vein. The two veins then cross the midline in front of the vertebral column and drain into the azygous vein draining the right side of the thorax. The azygous ultimately drains into the superior vena cava on its way into the right atrium of the heart. Now that's the quote-unquote standard anatomy, but in reality there is a lot of variability in the zygous system. Sometimes the hemiazygous and accessory hemiazygous fuse before crossing the midline. Sometimes there is only a single azygous vein along the midline draining both sides of the body. Just another example of how you're unique, just like everybody else. The intercostal nerves are simply a continuation of the ventral primary rami after the dorsal rami have branched to reach the intrinsic back. No complicated plexus here, it's pretty straightforward. As the spinal nerves leave the vertebral canal, they first give off the dorsal primary rami that supply the intrinsic back muscles and skin along the dorsal midline. The ventral rami course laterally to form the intercostal nerve branches, which run inferiorly to the arteries and veins. They supply the intercostal muscles as well as the thoracic dermatomes described in the segment of the spinal cord and spinal nerves. Laterally, a cutaneous branch perforates the wall along with the vascular branches to supply the lateral wall of the thorax. The intercostal nerves continue anteromedially, providing anterior cutaneous branches. One final note here. We've discussed the 11 pairs of intercostal nerves coursing along the body but wouldn't there also be a 12th pair under the final rib? Well, there is. It's called the subcostal nerve, and we'll return to it in the segment on the posterior abdominal wall. One final clinical note of importance is related to needle aspiration and the placement of chest tubes. In our session on the lungs and pleural cavity, we discuss pneumo and hemothorax, which is the collection of air or blood in the pleural space between the lung and thoracic wall, which can lead to a collapsed lung. In order to reflate the lung, this air or fluid must be removed. Smaller accumulations can be removed with a needle and syringe, while large or progressive accumulations require the placement of a chest tube. In either case, the instrumentation must pass through the chest wall in one of the intercostal spaces. Physicians will use surface landmarks such as the sternal angle to locate particular ribs then palpate the wall to count ribs and identify the appropriate intercostal space for the point of entry. This is discussed further in the session of the pleural cavity and lungs. Now regardless of the entry point, a knowledge of the neurovascular structures to the thoracic cage is of critical importance when penetrating the thoracic wall with these procedures. Because of the proximity of the neurovascular structures to the underside of the rib, clinicians will use the superior border of the lower rib
to penetrate the intercostal space and avoid the intercostal neurovascular structures. Still need to be cautious, however. There are collateral branches, not shown in this image, that pass close to the superior border of the rib, although they are small in size and less easily damaged. Still, the needle is angled to avoid these structures when piercing the wall. In discussing the muscles, you've probably noticed that I glazed over their specific functions. Well, that's because there's some debate with this topic. Traditionally, we have taught that the external intercostals lift up the inferior ribs to elevate the rib cage during forced inspiration, while the internal and innermost intercostals depress the rib during forced expiration. But now, we're not so sure how correct this information is. When you think about it, the muscles all contract to bring the ribs closer together, whether it's inspiration or expiration. It's quite possible that the additional muscles, such as the sternocleidomastoid and scalenes, have an important role in elevating the ribs during inspiration, while the obliques play more of a role in depressing the ribs during expiration. The intercostals may play a similar role in both processes, ensuring that the ribs move as a functional unit. Jury's still out on this one. That'll do it for the anterolateral thoracic wall. In the next session, we head south and look at the anterolateral abdominal wall. See you then.